God's Word. The Old Testament reading for today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. The New Testament reading is from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. I think in truth, the, the reading of scripture is the high part of the service. Everything else before and after that is kind of a letdown. Um, I hope your, if your iPhones are devices are on, it's, I have to break it to you, but the Redskins did not make it to the playoffs, um, or this far into the playoffs for 25 years now, so um, if it's on, I'm assuming it's you're taking copious notes. Um, we are working through the Ten Commandments. Last week was just our introduction to talk about uh, what it means that he's just claiming us as his own. That's where we started with that, and the, the big picture of that one is God didn't just come as a liberating force, but as an occupying force. And the Ten Commandments are how he wants to occupy us. Again, and as we said, they, they point us to God's moral heart so that we may see what we need and who he is and what we want to be as a people. And today, uh, as we're looking at uh, this particular commandment to have no other gods before him uh, from Exodus 20, verse 3, we're, we're looking at, in essence, kind of what it means to, in some, for, for many people to miss the point. Just recently... Uh, the Rose Bowl, as you know, uh, it's a big football game, but even more important for many people is the Rose Bowl parade. Um, the, the flowers, they say you can smell it for blocks away. There's just roses everywhere and flowers everywhere. And two famous comedians, actually three, a whole bunch of Saturday Night Live alum, thought it'd be hilarious if they made a really, really good fake broadcast on Amazon Prime. Like, looking just like it's a real deal thing. And they had a little bit of makeup on. Well, apparently, a large number of people missed that this was a joke and tuned into Amazon Prime to watch their telling of the Rose Bowl Parade. And they couldn't figure out why, as the parades were going by, the, the commentators were talking about the salmon and were talking about, you know, rainbows and talking about people like, there are no rainbows, what are you talking about? And started talking about their lives and personal details. And people were saying, giving them one-star comments, saying, these are the worst reporters ever. Totally missing the point that it was an entire spoof. So I felt bad for those people who watched the entire Rose Bowl parade through the eyes of these comedians who talked nothing about the Rose Bowl parade. Uh, reminding about uh, missing the point, I can, I, and I see it now as a, as a pastor who gets to help people with weddings. There are many times when uh, the bride or the groom, as they're preparing for a wedding, forget what the points. The big picture is about, which is um, to make your parents happy in the wedding. Um, for many people, they think it's about their own plans, but it's not at all. Uh, I learned this myself in a painful, painful way. Uh, but spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, um, I can remember, too, uh, completely missing the point of Scripture. Completely missing the point of the Word. Had you asked me before I became a Christian, before I came to know Christ, what was the point? I said, the point of Christianity, the point of the Bible, is to give you a lot of rules, to force something upon you. And I realized later how wrong it was. That's what we're going to look at today. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would reveal yourself to our hearts, to our minds, to our lives, through your word. 
We pray for all the children and the teachers upstairs that you would bless them as well. We thank you for this moment and pray, Lord God, you would take it and make it yours so that we may know more about you and be changed by that. All to your glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So the question we want to ask is, so how important are the Ten Commandments? As one commentator pointed is that God has indeed changed us irrevocably. And the Ten Commandments are now showing us how we are to live. We've been free. We don't know what to do. And he's coming to show us the way we are to live now. Another commentator, uh, so what Christ did on the cross, when he died on the cross, that's called Calvary. That was on the hill called Calvary. When the law, the Ten Commandments, were handed to Moses, that was on Mount Sinai. And one commentator pointed that the only event in all of human history that it exceeds the Ten Commandments coming on Mount Sinai is what happened on Mount Calvary. Meaning, if you want to compare how important it is that we receive the Ten Commandments, the only place you can look in all of human history is the cross. That's how powerful and important they are. So as we're talking about Exodus 20, verse 3, the, the, it's, 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 you are to have no other gods before me. You are to have no other gods before me. This reminds me a little bit to get us there is of dual citizenship. To have no other gods before me means a couple different things we're going to look at. It means what does it mean by gods? What does it mean to have nothing before him? And this reminded me of uh, the way America views dual citizenship. Technically, uh, or specifically, you're not allowed to be dual citizens, but there is a, technically you can't, <laughs> which is interesting. The way it works is America only recognizes one citizenship. But, as we learned living abroad, that uh, you can be a dual citizen. The way it works is this. If you become a dual citizen from another country, whatever, and you are also an American citizen, the way you can only, it's interesting, because they have this on, like, the, we were living in, in England, uh, on the website, can you be dual citizens? No, but here's how if you want to. <laughs> and the way it works is, is you're an American citizen. America wants to know that first and foremost, you are an American. So what that means is coming in and out of America, you always declare yourself an American. If for some reason you declare yourself another nationality as you come in or out of America, then what you're saying is to, to the State Department, I am not an American, and that's when you lose your citizenship. And to have no other gods before me is, is something kind of similar. The first thing is to have no other gods. It's monotheistic, meaning there is only one. You don't, uh, uh, officially or unofficially, you don't worship, you don't fear, you don't bow down, you don't sacrifice to any other gods. There are options out there. There are options in how many gods, and there are options about who it is going to be your god. And the first part is that you are going to have one. The Lord Yahweh, the one we just talked about last week, the one who has delivered and saved you. He is to be your ultimate direction and your ultimate direction giver, your ultimate authority. That's what it means to have no other gods. So the first question you've got to ask right now is who or what is yours? Who or what is your ultimate authority? The best way to say this was, who is it you quote most when it comes to authoritative things? The second part, but to have no other gods before me. What does that mean, to have no other gods before me? Well, the, the, the driving force underneath that is, is, God tells us he is a jealous God. Jealousy can make you... Can, derived from some really unhealthy places. And even the New Testament says there's an unhealthy form of jealousy. But God's talking about, when he means he's jealous, he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous, I'm zealous for, for you and what you're giving to others. Because it's going to do something to you if you don't. This idea of jealousy, I read articles about there are horrible things people have done in the name of jealousy. There was a really story about a, a, a woman in, uh, I think it was Kenya, whose, whose boyfriend broke, they broke up and the boyfriend decided he's going to sleep on her front porch every day. And uh, just to make sure I let other guys know that, you know, he's upset. And she had to get a court to say, to literally go say, you need to go sleep in your bed now. Um, uh, in the same way, when God says he is jealous, this is important. It's that, let's just know one, that there is some emotion behind his dealing with us. That he cares greatly about 
who your heart is worshiping as the Lord. I experience this with um, all the time in different ways, my own heart and everyone's. I remember once my, uh, my daughter, my own daughter was getting a little jealous of what I was doing with her brothers, how I was getting to hang out with her brothers. And so I was sitting downstairs on the couch and she came and sat next to me and she goes, you know, in her little four-year-old words, Daddy, we need to talk. I'm like, all right, what is it? He goes, she goes, listen, uh, I do things with you, but you don't do things with me. <laughs> and I go, what? She goes, I'm always doing stuff with you, but you don't ever do anything with me. I'm like, we hang out all the time. She's like, doing your stuff. <laughs> She's like, what are we going to do my things? And I realized she was jealous that I was, did some stuff with the boys that, that someone, like one of her brothers that he was fun. She's like, when are you going to play dolls with me? Right? She was jealous. When he says you have no other gods before me, that means this, that who God is, not just that he's the one authority, but who he is to you in terms of your heart, there is no comparison. He's in a category all to himself. It means you put nothing else before him, but it means that compared to him, everything else is but a shadow. Everything else is weak. Everything else is frail. So that's where we have to start asking yourself, is that who he is to your ultimate authority, your ultimate guide? You're, you're not only the one giving you the directions, but the one who is directing you. Is he incomparable in your heart? Completely set apart. You cannot compare the two. Is that who he is to you? One of the most important reasons God gives for why this must be in our hearts is not because he needs to derive anything from it. He doesn't need anything. But because we do. It's so important because we need him to be our one and only God. Jesus tries to teach about this in so many different ways. Uh, John Wycliffe, the famous uh, translator of the Bible, says this, The New Testament is full of authority, full of authority, and open to the understanding of everyone at the point you need most for salvation. God's word is our authority because of it stems from. What is the authority in your life? So we're going to look now at... Uh, parable Jesus gave, well not a parable, a description the famous seven I am, the New Testament in the book of John, Jesus describes himself as the I am in seven different ways, he gives seven different I am's, eight depending on um, some how you count, but he describes himself as I am and we're going to see how he is I am the shepherd, and that's what we're going to look at now and again what he's trying to communicate is how essential is it that you have no other gods so essential, he needs to explain it to you in a way you haven't heard or redefine it he's going to describe having no other gods as a good shepherd. How would you describe it to say he is your ultimate? The ultimate authority. Would you describe it as the good shepherd? It's very easy to say, but it's entirely hard to do. It's entirely to, it's impossible almost to do that. To let him be your one true God. That's the problem of sin. That we functionally get that we need God, but we're able to live apart from him in certain ways. And so when he says, I need to be your one true God, you're kind of used to living without him. And so the struggle is, how much do we really need him to be our one true God? And Jesus tries to, tries to address that in John 10, 1 through 11. So in verses 1 through 6 here, he gives us a reason What's the reason we need him to be our good shepherd? And this reminds me, as we're hearing about it, have any of you ever followed bad GPS before? I can remember one intense uh, fight uh, I got into with Zinnia earlier on in marriage was I was sure my internal map was accurate. And it turns out it was not. Um, I forgot which side the ocean was on. And as we were driving north in Massachusetts, I was sure that the ocean was on my right, but it turns out the road we were on wasn't going north or south at all. So what was on my right was not the Atlantic. What was on my right was Connecticut. Um, and in the same way, who is your uh, 
GPS is a little bit what he's addressing. Who is guiding you? So look at this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but by climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls out his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them all out, he goes before them. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will follow him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And to the figure of speech, Jesus gave with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So what is the reason, again, is that it is only Christ. It's only Christ who's going to lead us to this hope, this peace, this pasture. Everything else, anyone else trying to do that other than Christ is actually trying to do something to you. They're actually going to be a robber. They're taking that from you. So to have any other God before you is not just a different way of what we leave with this first teaching Jesus is trying to say is that if he is not that one for you, that good shepherd for you, that you're being robbed, you're being stolen. So the answer is, so what is the reason for him needing to be that person? Without him, you are losing something. You are losing the hope and peace that only he can lead you to. So him being your one and only, your ultimate authority, your one God, only he and he will you find peace. So the next, in verses 7 through 10, the question we want you to ask her is, what is the risk? So what is the risk of him not being your shepherd? Let's read verse 7 through 10. So again, Jesus tried to explain it to them and they didn't get it. So Jesus said to them, again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastor. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. What is the risk? Well, the first one is that if someone's coming and trying to come in and take his place, they're leading you somewhere. This next one where he's trying to say, what is the, the risk? What's the, that was the reason that only he can lead you where you need to go. Next is, what is the risk? That if you're putting your hope, your faith, your trust in anyone else, you're destined to be destroyed. It's going to lead to the destruction of your soul without him. The answer is without him. <laughs> without him, something is destroyed permanently. What you need most, only he can offer. You'll be robbed of your true salvation. Not having Christ, not having him as your only true God, your ultimate in life, will lead to further destruction of who you are on the inside. Eventually, again, we seem to do good at living life apart from him. And so the struggle is, why do we need him? And so we say, there's a reason why he's the only one who can lead you. And there's a risk. The risk is that if he is not there is damage being done to you on the inside. You may not see it. You may not feel it. But he's telling us it's happening. It's happening on a spiritual level. Destruction. This is why he needs to be our one and truly. Our ultimate. And then we get to this wonderful passage in verse, the second half of verse 10 and verse 11. What is the reward? So I talked about what's the reason, what's the risk, what's the reward? What's the reward of him being your shepherd? Again, he's saying, Jesus is trying to say, you understand what it means for me to be your one and only God, to have no other gods before me? It's like not a weight being lifted and thrown upon you. It's not you are enchained. It's like a good shepherd. A good shepherd. In verse, the second half of verse 10 and 11 says this. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Again, when you had asked me, what was the point of Christianity? How do you find a way? I was like, well, I have a list of things I haven't done, so that must mean I'm okay. I haven't killed anybody. In the same way, when I viewed scripture and everything else, it was definitely a chain. 
It was something I abhorred and didn't want anything to do with. But when Christ came and finally took hold of my heart and became my ultimate, what didn't accompany that was depression and sadness and despair and hopelessness. What accompanied it was abundant life. Life like I never would have expected. Like, like I never could have hoped for or dreamed for. I was being renewed and awakened on the inside. My soul, which was doomed for destruction, is now being repaired and redeemed and woken up to who he is. So what is the reward? A true, abundant life. As one professional coach put it, if you ever picked any sport, every sport has rules. And if you try to throw someone out there um, without knowing the rules of the sport, the, the, the game is frustrating. It doesn't make sense. You ever try to turn on a game and not know the thing why the refs are blowing the whistle, what's happening? But as you learn about who designed it and the rules, everything starts to make more sense. And as a player, you begin to truly love the game. is bringing his commandments to bring life to us. He has come to being our God to do something greater. Having no other God means it's accepting that he has come to you. Got it? When you have no other gods, you realize that you cannot get to him, that he had to come to you, and that he did. He brought his commandments down. He brought Christ himself to us. Having no other gods, acknowledging I have no other shepherd but Jesus Christ alone. And thank goodness for that. All other shepherds either promise something fake or will lead me somewhere fake. Only the good shepherd, only Jesus Christ will come and bring me life and lead me to life eternal. And just like the Hippocratic Oath what some people call the first commandment of medical practice. Do no harm. <laughs> and contained in that is not just do no harm, but also you're supposed to promote health. The Ten Commandments are the same thing. The first commandment is the same thing. It prohibits, again, prohibits because of what it does to you. Not just because God is cranky. He's saying that any of these things, if it is not him, lead you to destruction. So it's saying what does prohibit, what it prohibits is atheism, Pluralism, a divided heart. Looking to ourselves or our conscience to find good and right or holy. Resisting the spirit. Giving something else credit for something God has done. Worshiping or adoring someone else or some other God. In word or deed. Allowing something or someone else other than God in his word to be your God. But what does it promote? What does him being your one and only promote? It tells you to trust God as your good shepherd. Having no other God for you means you trust him and him alone as your good shepherd. It means you follow where he leads. It means to be filled with life and hope and peace. That's what he wants and only this. It also means to guard those around you from following false shepherds. It means to mourn and love what he mourns and loves. So in essence, what does the first commandment prohibit? It prohibits death. It is telling you, you need to avoid death. And the only way you avoid death is by having him as your Lord and God. The only way to find life in eternity is with Jesus Christ. What does it promote? Well, if it prohibits death, that means it promotes life. In essence, you now have a life, a heart that beats for what he wants. His holiness, his righteousness, what he considers good, that is life. So it's telling you, avoid death. Find life. That's what the first commandment is screaming to us. God, as we read here, especially in verse 11, 10 and 11, 
But the first commandment tells us is God cannot give us any more. The reason why he should be your only Lord and Savior. You should have no other gods before him. No other gods, no other gods before him is because no other God can give you more. No other God can give you life and holiness and abundance. And no other God can do what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. No other God can give you more. He died for us. So just like I missed so much when I just thought what Christianity was about, I missed the point completely. This is what we need to share with ourselves and the world around us. So what does this command to show us that we need? It shows us we need a new heart. A heart that beats like the Lord. It gives us a new heart. And lastly, this first commandment is that our heart is being changed. And this first commandment, hopefully, will point others towards their need for the good shepherd. That is who he is, the good shepherd. So, are you missing the point? What does it mean to you to have no other gods before him? Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for what you did on the cross. Lord, help us to see it is not, while it might be intimidating, you are an all-powerful God, that we should rejoice and be exuberant that you are our one true God and help us to see in our hearts whether we put anything else, anyone else, before you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.